Good afternoon. <laughs> How's everyone doing today? Good. Uh, so um, we are the the readings for this week was uh, Roberto's the overthrow of the dictatorship of no alternatives, uh, which um, uh, relates to uh, the theory and the nature of U.S. exceptionalism, which is a central theme of the course uh, and also of how to address this, uh, the, uh, ex the extreme degree of the notion of U.S. exceptionalism, uh, whether it's defined in terms of individualism um, or it's defined in terms of uh, the nation as uh, truly uh, exceptional. Uh, and uh, we felt it was helpful to, um, uh, to uh, discuss uh, the possibilities for change today. And then next week, we discuss the American prophets, the antebellum prophets, uh, Emerson, Whitman, Melville, and Lincoln, uh, who will hopefully um, in further inform our understanding and appreciation for the idea of uh, American exceptionalism uh, and uh, individualism. Uh, and so I had suggested in our conversation last week that one way to approach the idea of American exceptionalism is to say the United States on many dimensions, yes. the dimension of inequality, yes. the dimension of religiosity, the dimension of openness to the new and experimentalism represents an extreme of commitments and arrangements common among the rich right. society. Rich North Atlantic societies. Rich yes. North Atlantic society. Yes. Huh? And uh, these readings or this topic for today throws a special light on that. Right. That what seems to be central in the United States on the one side, a deepening, a radicalization of an idea of individualism, yes. of autonomy. Right. That's the central idea. But then second, the identification of that abstraction, the abstraction of autonomy, with a whole institutional order. Right. Uh, and all of the details of which are crucial to the character of the national experience. Yes. And obviously that's what's contestable right at right. the outset. Right. What is remarkable and deserves criticism or resistance is this idea that an abstract conception of autonomy could be related to a very specific uh, set of institutional arrangements. Yes, yes. Because if you begin then to shift the institutional arrangements, presumably the revision of the institutional arrangements has an effect on the ideal of autonomy. That's right, huh? that's right. And that's the whole terrain begins to move. Now, we made a conscious decision to organize this discussion in a way that is more complicated than a linear scheme might suggest. Right. The linear scheme would be, say, we'll study American history and American structure, and then at the end, we'll discuss the future or right. alternatives. Right. Right. But of course, your understanding of something depends always on your view of what it might become. Right, right. It's transformations in the realm of the adjacent possible. Right. And therefore, on that view, this dialectic between insight into the actual and imagination of the possible is not something that should be postponed. It has to come at the beginning. Right, that's right. So right from the outset, that's what's problematic. Right. That's the wound. Right. Huh? Right, we have to touch. Uh, <laughs> yes, it's the wound that we have to touch. Uh, and so you, in your, the overthrow of the dictatorship of no alternatives, uh, I've, I asked you this earlier, so um, first, with the title, why do you use the term dictatorship of no alternatives? Because 
it's experienced in the world as a situation of no exit. There are no options. Okay. There are no live options. That is, there's a very small repertoire of live options for the organization of different parts of social life. Right. There's a kind of regulated market economy that exists among the rich North Atlantic countries right. with more or less social content, right. but within a very narrow range. Right. And then outside of that, in the rest of the world, there's nothing. Basically, there's authoritarian state capitalism, right. the combination of autocratic regimes right. with markets, market orders characterized by savage inequalities. Right. And that then are, that's the whole range of alternatives. So we have this ambitious ideological vocabulary inherited from the 20th century. Right. There's the right and the left, and that's the right. this and the that, but which pretends this vocabulary that there are all these options. Yes. But the actual experience of the historical circumstance is that there are no options. Right. Only these tiny adjustments at the margin. So that's then the justification for the title. Right. So how how would we how would one um, redefine uh, the distinctions between conservative and progressive right and left? So I think there are different places to begin. So okay. one place to begin is this one that I just suggested yeah. now, which is the link between the ideal of individualism or right. autonomy right. and the institutional structure. Right. Uh, and the ideal of autonomy can be characterized in different ways. One way of characterizing it is in its theological character. Yes. The individual participates in the internal life of God. Yes. For the American religion, that is not the established Christian churches or the secular humanism, but what Bloom called the American religion, which were these religions invented by the Americans. Yes. The individual has some direct participation in the internal life of God. Right, right. And, and God has a direct exactly. participation in the internal life of yeah, the individual. So let's start there. I'm okay. going to read two texts. Here. Okay, okay. One is from Harold Bloom's book, The American Religion, yes. about this theme. So, and I'm going to read two, pa two brief passages here. Freedom in the context of the American religion means being alone with God or with Jesus, the American God or the American Christ. In social reality, this translates as solitude, at least in the inmost sense. The soul stands apart, and something deeper than the soul the real me or self or spark thus is made free to be utterly alone with a God who is also quite separate and solitary, that is, a free God or God of freedom. What makes it possible for the self and God to commune so freely is that the self already is of God. Unlike body and even soul, the American self is no part of the creation or of evolution through the ages. This is Bloom's idea that it's an agnostic religion, like yes. orphanism, yes. Yes. in which the self was there at the beginning. Yes. Huh? And then he goes on a little later and says, the essence of the American is the belief that God loves her or him, a conviction shared by nearly nine out of 10 of us according to a Gallup poll. Right. To live in a country where the vast majority so enjoys God's affection is deeply moving. And perhaps an entire society can sustain being the object of so sublime a regard, which after all was granted only to King David in the whole of the Hebrew Bible. So I think Bloom is exaggerating because he is not doing justice to the Christian theology of the incarnation. Yes. yes. Uh, which is a feature of all Christianity and yes, not just yes. in American religion. God created the world yes. out of a superabundance of love. Yes. And this same superabundance of love is then manifested in the incarnation. Yes. 
I yes. mean the figure of the Redeemer. Yes. Now I want to read a second passage from a work of the, Ger the contemporary German philosopher, Peter Sloterdijk, uh, in which he discusses what happens when these beliefs are secularized or the religious faith weakens. The same belief in autonomy or individualism as a prop to the self-affirmation of the individual. If in society you invoke the Redeemer, your credit will shrink. The Enlightenment is really a language game for cognitive winners who continually deposit the premiums of knowledge and critique in their accounts and exhibit their cultural funds while faith gets increasingly hidden behind the barrier of embarrassment to be crossed only when one is among like-minded others, and moreover is ready to give up the advanced boasting potential of the Enlightenment. In a general way, the modern tribute to heroes necessarily faces a complicating factor, namely that eulogistic functions are increasingly dependent on scientific premises and must satisfy the dictates of political correctness. Nowadays, you always have to have in view the side effects of each tribute and to calculate the angle of refraction or indirect self-enhancement. But the main rule is that all eulogistic remarks have to be ontologically correct and that no claims are made of actual interventions from transcendence into imminence. The leeway for boasting shrinks. The strategy of indirect self-celebration in high culture hits the investor with ever greater costs and diminishing narcissistic returns. Summing up this state of affairs is the term humanism, such as ethicists use it today. To all speakers, it suggests the return to a carefully considered sort of self-affirmation that is only barely distinguishable from medium-level depression. 20th century mass culture would first designate a way out of this quandary by disconnecting self-praise from remarkable performance and other things admiration of which was based on superior criteria. This disconnection thus enabled primitive feelings of exhilaration to step onto the fourth stage where a public of accomplices in disinhibition awaits intent on cheering. So that's, that's a characterization of this transformation. Yes. So there's the ideal of of, of autonomy, of individualism, presented in its theological aspect. And now it's to be associated with a whole range of institutional arrangements. Uh, for example, the kind of proto-democratic liberalism that the Americans organize in their constitutional arrangements, or the particular dogmatic version of the market economy. Uh, and I hope that in today's conversation we can go into the details of these crucial institutional arrangements. But the point, the methodological point, which I'm making now at the beginning, is that the self-understanding of the country, and therefore the core of American exceptionalism, has to do with the relation between these two things between the idea of autonomy, right. the self-affirmation, the jubilation, the jubilatory narcissism, the extension of the, the deepening of this project of autonomy, and all of this institutional stuff, uh, and which is wrapped in to, right. to the idea that the country has of itself. Right. So if once you begin to press against the institutional structure, all the terrain begins to shift yes. because 
the abstract conception of autonomy is not enough to fix the identity of the country. That's right, that's right. So that then ties into this idea which we introduced last week in the first class, that there are two different narratives in American history, right? There's the narrative that it's all about black and white, right. and about the <laughs> Civil War and its aftermath. Right. And the slave society had to be destroyed and defeated, as right. it was in the Civil War. But now there's unfinished business, right. because slavery has a long afterlife. And so there's all this stuff which then fills up the, the affairs of the Americans. Yes. The civil rights legislation, right. the race-based forms of inequality yes. that generalize yes. the new identity politics, yes. and so So that's one narrative. But the alternative view uh, is that that's not the main narrative, that there is that problem of the unfinished business of the Civil War. But there is another problem which is much more fundamental, much more central, and which affects directly the white working class majority of the country. What happened to that society of artisans, of small-scale proprietors, of petty traders in the North uh, before the Civil War? It was destroyed. It was destroyed after, with the war, after, after, yes. After the Civil War, as a result of the Civil War, yes. then came Mass, mass immigration yes. and industrialization, yes. Yes. economic accumulation, concentration of economic power. Yes. Uh, so that society of small scale producers was, was undone. Right. Huh? right. Uh, how could it have survived? It couldn't have survived as what it was uh, because uh, as a society of small-scale proprietors and farmers and tradesmen, because small-scale family business is incompatible yes. with the aggregation of resources at scale required by a complex, modern, dynamic economy. Right. But could it have survived in some other form? So that question of the relation of the economic freedom to the abstract ideal of autonomy yes. is a crucial question in defining what the Americans mean when they claim to base their identity on this connection right, right. between the abstraction and the institutional arrangements. And that's what I hope we can discuss in at least part of today's class. Right. And you have, um, so, uh, you have um, implicitly a number of things to say about that in your um, revisionist view or how to change yes. the structures right. so of the nation. And, and so much of your wonderful article is about the structure in relation, uh, the structures of uh, institutions in relation to individuals. So one way to approach this problem is from the standpoint of the agent. Yes. Uh, in the case of American history, the agent being these, these small scale right. traders, proprietors, artisans. Right. Uh, and this is, has contemporary significance because I say today in the world, it's not that the majority of people in the world are this petty bourgeoisie, but they have a petty bourgeois horizon of aspiration. Right. They aspire to they the, aspire to that. To the artisanal and in the absence bourgeois. of some other tangible expression of this petty bourgeois dream, the default expression is traditional, archaic, isolated family business yes. based on self exploitation and family saving. Yes. You can say, well that has no future. First of all, has no future for the individual. He can right. eke out a modest prosperity, right. but he's not going to go anywhere. Right. Huh? And, each, each, and it each, has no collective future. That's right. Because it doesn't create the basis for a new growth miracle. That's right. A new qualitative jump in inclusive productivity right. for the nation 
Right. So, and I think we, so I think from that point in the discussion, we would have begin, we would have to begin to descend into the institutional details. Yes, uh -huh. yes. So let's take the market first, right. you know, the market order. And let's start with an abstract, with an abstraction. What is a market? So a market is a simplified form of cooperation among strangers. Right. That is unnecessary when there is high trust right. and impossible when there is no trust. Right. So these contemporary forms of market order are based on the generalization of a modicum of trust of low trust among strangers. Right. And it's a contrast to earlier forms of social life and the production that distinguished uh, the way you treat insiders to your yes. group yes. and the way you treat outsiders. Everything for the insiders, nothing for the outsiders. Right. Modern contract law is based on a rejection of that. Right? So there has to be a generalization of a, minute, a modicum of trust among strangers. At the moment, now take that idea of the market up to the highest level of abstraction. Even at the most abstract level, it has at least two dimensions. One dimension is uh, the absolute level of economic decentralization. The number of economic agents able to bargain on their own initiative and for their own account. The second dimension is the absoluteness of the control that each of those agents has over the resources at his command. Is it, for example, perpetual? Or do they have property perpetually? Can they transmit it through the hereditary transmission of property? Are all the constituent powers of property bundled together? to form the unified property right, which is then vested in the same right holder, the owner. Right. Uh, it, that's one form. Now, the dogmatic idea of the market, one of the premises of the American institutions, is that these two dimensions go together naturally and necessarily. But it's quite obvious that they don't go together that if one of the ways in which you might radicalize economic decentralization, as the number of agents who can bargain on their own initiative and for their own account, is to limit the other dimension, the degree to which each of those agents has absolute and perpetual control. For example, you can say they have fragmentary claims on the productive resource and opportunity, or they have temporary claims. For example, take the following thought experiment just to reveal what's at stake in this. Imagine that the means of production, as Marx called them, the productive resources and opportunities of society, rather than being vested in absolute individual owners or transferred from those owners to the state, is vested in independent social funds that are managed under different models experimentally. You, you try out different ways of doing it, you see what works, doesn't work, you increase one type and you diminish another. And these funds, according to this thought experiment, conduct a kind of roving capital auction. They auction off the productive resources of society to those who might assure the funds of the highest rate of return. Now, is that not a market order? Of course it's a market order. Uh, and you could describe it, I describe it facetiously in this text as capitalism without capitalists. Right, right, because right. no one has absolute and perpetual control of the productive resources. The productive resources are the object of a roving permanent capital auction. Right. So imagine now that the project in the United States after the Civil War, 
initially for the North and then for the whole country, would have been to lift up those small traders by some larger counterpart to agricultural extension, right? right. Agricultural extension, I, we gave that example last week, right. was the basis for the creation in the United States of a family scale agriculture with entrepreneurial attributes. Right. Uh, right. Through a partnership between the small scale producer and the state, right. and cooperative competition among the small scale producers. And now imagine that, that that's the object for all of the economic agents to lift them up, some, some uplift operation. So for the small and medium sized firms, the backward firms of the economic periphery, to open up the, the passage to the knowledge economy, to bring them closer to the vanguard, the technological and practical frontier of production. And for the mass of autonomous economic agents who have no uh, stable connection to business organization, to lift them up as well by transforming them into technologically equipped artists. Right. Huh? Like, for example, the nurse practitioner to give her technology, to give her more advanced practice, the machine repairman to assist him and so forth. So then there begins a, a, a lift up operation. You can imagine that then there's a second stage uh, in which uh, there begins to emerge out of this uplift operation a new institutional design, which on the horizontal axis would be based on partnership or strategic coordination between the government and the producer, the small scale producer, uh, and uh, as well as this is on the vertical axis between government and producer, and on the horizontal axis, cooperative competition. So they compete against one another, but they also pool resources, achieving through the pooling of resources economies of scale. And then the third stage, far into the future, the approximation to this model of the capital market. So, now, just take that as the invocation of a direction in which the idea of the market is preserved, but the market is reinvented. Because after all, one of the things shown by the example of the democratization of the agricultural market in early American history is that there are three things you can do with the market order. One thing is you can regulate it. And in fact, every regulatory strategy is the provisional first step in a strategy of reorganization. Right. The second is you can compensate for the inequalities generated in the market order through compensatory redistribution by progressive taxation or redistributive social spending. That's re corrective redistribution by tax and transfer. Right. The third thing you can do with the market order is much more important than those two things. The third thing is to reinvent its legal and institutional architecture, to reinvent what the market order is. The reason why it's so much more important is that the first two things, regulation and compensatory redistribution, shape the secondary distribution, it's a corrective redistribution. The, f the third thing shapes the primary distribution. That is, the, the original distribution achieved by the market, quite apart from any correction. The problem with attempting to achieve redistribution through correction is that it inevitably in faces a limit in the established economic incentives and arrangements, the incentive to save, to invest, and to employ. If, if, the, if the corrective redistribution is radical or if its dimension becomes too big, then 
it begins to exact an unacceptable cost in lost output or limited rise of productivity. And that tension is then captured in the familiar rhetorical apparatus of a tension between equity and efficiency. So it's much more important to change the primary or original distribution than to form some secondary or corrected distribution. So there you have an example in the economic domain of how there could be a project to create a future for the small scale proprietors, the original petty bourgeoisie, which is different from, uh, which is which is which, which is different from economic concentration, right. but different as well from isolated archaic family business. Right. Now, shall I go on one more step yes. just just yes. to fill out the yes. picture because I want to give some more idea of the institutional content. So now take democracy. Uh -huh. You know, the Americans organized under their constitution, not a democracy, but a kind of proto-democratic liberalism right. originally. Right. There were all sorts of constraints, for example, on the suffrage, yeah. uh, which were loosened later, but the fundamental character of the constitutional arrangements was not changed. Right. Uh, Napoleon Bonaparte uh, advised that a constitution should be brief and obscure. But the only people who seemed to have followed his advice were the Americans. And they then created this constitutional arrangement, uh, which uh, they then changed typically, not by changing it, but by reinterpreting it. So, uh, and now, so take some of the dimensions of the constitutional arrangements and why I'm calling it a proto-democratic liberalism. So first, it's based on a low level of popular mobilization in political life. Uh, the premise of conservative political science and conservative statecraft is that there is an inverse relation between political institutionalization and political mobilization. So consequently, a, a form of political life must either be cold and institutional, or it must be hot and anti-institutional or extra-institutional. That's Caesarism. So, at the end of the day, as I suggest there in that text, you have to choose between Madison and Mussolini. Right. Huh? Right. That's, that's <laughs> the premise of conservative statement. Now, is that premise true or is it false? It's a crucial question. Right. Because one would take the view that a set of political arrangements can be both hot and institutional. And then one of the important ways in which political arrangements differ from one another is in the extent to which they arouse and sustain the level of organized popular engagement in political life. It depends on a host of details. The rules governing the relation between money and politics, between politics and the means of mass communication, the voting rules, for example, whether voting is mandatory or not. In many contemporary democracies, both rich and poor, the vote is mandatory which just means that everyone has to vote subject to a fine and has, has the privilege of abstaining. And if you abstain under a system of mandatory voting, the significance of the abstention is much more eloquent than under a system of optional voting. So it depends on all these details. Now, now take a second dimension of the constitutional arrangements, because the pace of politics. In the American constitutional arrangements, there's a liberal principle of the fragmentation of power, mm -hmm. and there's a conservative <coughs> principle of the slowing down of politics. That's Madison's scheme of checks and balances. Right. And the Americans believe that these two principles are naturally and necessarily connected. But they're not naturally and necessarily connected. 
They're connected by design and intention to inhibit the transformative uses of politics. So the idea is you'll construct a kind of constitutional perpetual motion machine. Uh, and when there's an impasse, the tendency of the constitutional arrangements will be to perpetuate the impasse. The, and that will inhibit politics from being used to transform the arrangements. But you could do the opposite. You could say, no, we will affirm and even radicalize the liberal principle of the fragmentation of power in the state, but we will repudiate the conservative principle of the slowing down of politics. For example, we'll say that if there's a stalemate between the president and the Congress, the two political branches, either branch will enjoy the constitutional prerogative to dissolve the impasse by calling early elections. But the early elections will always be bilateral for both branches. So that the branch that invokes the constitutional privilege of calling the early elections will always have to pay the political price of running the electoral risk. And under that system, the presidential regime could be turned on its head and rather than be a device for the slowing down of politics, could become a machine for its acceleration. Uh, because what happens is that small institutional changes can have drastic effects. Right. Now take a third dimension of the constitutional arrangements, which is the relation between central power and the power of the periphery, the states, right. for example. And there was a famous contest in American history about states' rights, because the rights of states were used to entrench privilege, yes. racial oppression, class oppression, and so forth. So there's this idea that there's a pendular relation, a contradiction, power to the center or power to the states. But you could say, contrary to that idea, that you can have more of both, depending on how you shape the coexistence of concurrent and divided powers under the constitutional arrangements. You can say there are stages in the experimentalist uses of federalism, but the objective is the following. As, a, as society proceeds down a certain path, it hedges its bets by allowing parts of itself to deviate and to create counter models of the national future. So the initial step, stage of experiment is co cooperation, right. either horizontal cooperation among states in a certain region, or vertical cooperation among the three levels of the federation. Yeah. But then the second stage is what you would call wide divergence. A state can apply for a right to diverge from the national solution. That would have to be vetted politically by the political branches and judicially uh, to prevent abuse, to prevent oppression that's happened in American history. But the objective would be this objective of a dialectic of national experimentalism that would heat up politics. So there you have a simple model of how through a series of fragmentary institutional arrangements, you could increase the temperature of politics, right. accelerate the pace, and create this experimentalist dialectic between the center and the locality. Now, so here's my claim, taking an overview right, of this. Right. The ideal of autonomy, of individualism, in the character of American exceptionalism is anchored in all of this institutional stuff. But the content of the institutional stuff is what's decisive. And there's no reason why it has to have this particular shape. So if you began to reshape it by transforming the market uh, along the lines I suggested, right. and transforming the democracy, replacing the low energy democracy by a high energy democracy, the proto-democratic liberalism, by a radical democracy, 
the whole meaning of autonomy would change because then the, the autonomous individual is not this isolated agent, this little Napoleon crowning himself. Right. He's part of this collective life in which his, the, the enhancement of his power of agency, of creation, is the reverse side of a whole set of forms of collective democratic experimentalism. Well, I just wanted to say these things because they give some content to this yes. abstract idea. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> so in, in, I want to ask a question about the, um, the, the, the tension that you point out between state and fe the federalism and uh, the government between state and nation. Mm -hmm. uh, that you said that if, um, if, if a state receives uh, permission from the so federal- Political and judicial. Political and, and judicial and, would have to would have to be approved right. to a, prevent abuse to be, prevent, prevent abuse. abuse and oppression and persecution and so forth. Right. So would that, if that had been were implemented, would that allow, say, Texas or California, who both were advocating for um, exiting the United States, if they received approval, could they then leave? No. Why? Well, that's a different discussion. So the right of secession. So experimentalism is not secession. Okay. Right? Okay. So it's like it's like uh, Hirschman's discussion of exit or voice, right? So yes. Exit. Yes. Exit voice. So or so you you you. The premise of the nation is we're all the, we're all in this together. Yes. It's a community of faith. Yes. But within this community of faith, we don't have to act uniformly. We don't have to march in lockstep. Okay. Uh, so our unity is enriched and strengthened by our power to diverge and to contradict one another. Right. Okay. A very ancient theme in political thought. Right. Like Machiavelli said, the Roman Republic was united right. by the struggle between the patricians and the plebeians. Right. So, Struggle, conflict is not the opposite of union. Right. But there's still right. this right. idea right. that we're in this together. Right. Right. Okay. So, uh, and this is not, a, by the way, this is not a discussion restricted to federal systems. Right. Because a common prejudice is that experimentalism of this kind is easier to institute in fe in federations than in unitary states like the United Kingdom or France. Right. But that's not true. Right. Because an advantage that unitary states enjoy over federations in this respect is that in a unitary state there is no presumption that all parts of the country must enjoy at the same time the same right of divergence. So, the government of the United Kingdom can, for example, make a deal with Scotland that's different from the deal that it makes with Wales. Right. And that, so it's, that actually facilitates in the unitary state the design of this contradiction. Okay, that's good. That's good. Any questions, any uh, comments so far? Yes. I'm reminded of 
involving it in lots of stuff, in lots of joint initiatives. There's, in general, and this is, a, a, I think, a, a general um, principle in, in the arguments that we can have here over the semester, I don't believe in um, absolute guarantees in history. There's no such objective. I believe in the truth of uh, Alfred North Whitehead's proposition that the business of the future is to be dangerous. So it's not that you have some perpetual motion machine that <laughs> solves things. It's that you create a life that's more complicated, that has more points of engagement, of connection, fecundity. Uh, that's what you want. <coughs> but there are no guarantees. Things can go off the rails at any point. But the problem is when you design a system that is so preoccupied with preventing things from going off the rails that it allows nothing new to be created. Because after all, uh, any project in history is eventually goes down into the dust, right? The enemy is not the people, the enemy is time. Huh? So, for a project to retain life, it has to be reinvented. You have to be willing to let go uh, and to reinvent it. And in that process of letting go and reinventing it, in that interval of recreation, there can be a disaster. So, and then you say, well, can you guarantee me that there won't be a disaster? And my answer is, no, I can't. Uh, so that, that's the shape of that argument. <coughs> Yes. Um, in the first stage of the thought experiment, when um, the professor suggested that we do auction off the productive resources and invest them in the social funds, yeah. how would we then limit it so that it doesn't lead to the same sort of inequalities after the auction? Uh, how, did, how would we limit it in what way? You said? How would we limit it from becoming problematic? Like Because we would have a, a great variety of, uh, first of all, the funds, as I call them, would have uh, a range of different ways uh, of rules under which they would auction off. Different time horizons, different risk profiles. Now, if you take this thought experiment of the funds and their capital auction, the curiosity is this, and I think I mentioned this in that paper. Uh, some people would say, well, this is ridiculous, it's utopian. But other people would say, that's what already happened. Because the, th the, the orthodox theory of finance is that in a perfectly competitive capital market, the capital market already gives the productive, me the productive resources to their most effective uses. So if that's not happening, according to the orthodox theory, it must be because there's some localized flaw in competition, or else some localized flaw in the regulatory response to the localized competitive flaw. Now, the general idea is that a market order has no single natural and necessary form, right? It's, it's the inverse of the thesis of market fundamentals which is that a market has a single natural and necessary form. The thesis of market fundamentalism is that if Robinson Crusoe trades long enough on his island, he will eventually reproduce the whole system of German private law. Because implicit in spontaneous coordination is a whole legal logic. That's the thesis of market fundamentalism. The jurists demonstrated in, in from the middle of the 19th century to the end of the century, that this idea is false. That a market order has no natural and necessary form. So the central thesis in the light of that understanding is that the market order should not be fastened to a single dogmatic version of itself. It shouldn't be nailed to the cross. <laughs> 
of a single group. So I'm not saying that this idea of the funds and the capital auction should be the only form of economic decentralization. One of the forms of economic decentralization should continue to be the old absolute 19th century property right. Why? Because the property right has a tremendous advantage, which is that it allows someone, the owner, the absolute owner, to do something at his own risk that no one else believes in without having to negotiate the lifting of vetoes by a series of stakeholders. So we would always want the, that to be one of the forms of economic decentralization. But why would we want that to be the only form of economic decentralization? That's what doesn't make sense. Yes. The it idea seems what? like there's, you know, sort of uh, the autonomous individual. Autonomous. It, it seems like you're saying, you know, sort of at the end, I think you said that if the systems change, then the idea of the autonomous individual yes, will, exactly. will change. But of course, then the, the idea of the autonomous individual, it seems like it's also propping up the existing system. So, so I think we need to say a lot more. Numbers. I think we need to say a lot more because, and this is a subject for next week, yes. because the Yes. The, the prophecy, the prophetic message of the American prophets is focused on this idea of agency, autonomy, right? And what, or lack thereof. And we have it in the history of ideas, we have it in three different forms. So we have it in the form of the philosophers, Emerson and Nietzsche, yes. which uh, is bereft of a clear political and legal horizon. That's right. Huh? And Nietzsche actually yeah. loved Emerson. Yeah. yeah. A tremendous influence on Nietzsche. Yeah. Uh, and uh, then we have the second form, which is liberal political theory. Huh? And the central premise of liberal political theory is that. Uh, the distinction between the impersonal right, the neutral right, and the sectarian good, right? So people who have different visions of the good and including different religions, different ideas of salvation, can live peacefully under the same order. But the order of right, the constitutional and legal arrangement, should be neutral among these conflicting visions of the good. Now, that idea is false. There is no institutional order that is neutral among conflicting visions of the good. Because every institutional order tilts the scales of human experience, encourages some forms of experience, and discourages others. The invocation of an idea of neutrality is always in the service of its opposite, that is, it's an attempt to insulate or entrench against criticism, challenge, and change a particular institutional order, which then becomes absolute. Nevertheless, the false and dangerous idea of neutrality has a kinship to another idea which is not only valid but indispensable. An institutional order should be open to a large range of contradictory experience. And above all, it should be corrigible. It should lend itself to, def to, to correction and revision in the light of experience. So I would say contradiction and corrigibility are the legitimate counterparts to the illegitimate idea of neutrality. And, and, and agency is then what flourishes under this, this range of contradiction and, and corrigibility. The third voice of this liberal idea of autonomy is, of, of the idea of autonomy, is the romantic voice, right? It's romanticism. And the central conceit of romanticism is that structure and spirit are in inalterable opposition, right? So, uh, the uh, 
structure is the hand of Midas, right? It freezes living human experience, turns it to gold. Huh? It ceases to be lifelike, that structure. And so when are we alive, according to the Romantics? When are we alive? We're alive in those interludes when we shake the structures. So, for example, romantic love as opposed to the routines of married life. It, that's when we're alive, huh? But it so, depends upon a kind of transcendence. Yes. Yeah, so, so in the in the romantic novel, the marriage is never described, right? The marriage is the end product, but it's indescribable, huh? Uh, so, or it's the mass in the streets, the the crowd in the street, the revolutionary crowd, as opposed to the bureaucratic apparatus. And so. so Romanticism is a form of despair because it despairs of the possibility of changing the relation between spirit and structure, of creating a structure which is more hospitable to spirit because, for example, it facilitates its own revision. It narrows the space, the distance between the routine moves we make within a framework and the exceptional moods by which we change and study the frame. So what is the ideal of autonomy? It's, 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 it's the summation of all these different perspectives. Huh? But what I'm saying is it gains concreteness, weight, by its connection to an institutional structure. And that's why it was so important to, to give an idea of what, of what I mean by an institutional structure through these economic and constitutional examples. So it's the evocation of the form of agency, of creation, of construction, that is possible in a structure. That's what it is. And, and what you could say is, this then reveals the problem in classical liberalism, which is, um, it has an idea of autonomy and neutrality, but it has also a dogmatic institutional formula. If you challenge the formula, the classic system of legal rights, the whole conception of autonomy begins to move. And the movement, I think, rather than being the problem, is the solution. That's, that's how we create the new, through this dialectic in which we revise the arrangements, then we have a new understanding of the ideal and back and forth. And the, uh, so it's this internal transformation, this internal dialectic. And then of course there's always the possibility of a, a message coming from the outside. That's the prophetic element, the visionary element, which is not just this internal right. transformation. Right. Although, I mean, I would, I would say, I would just add to what you, said that romanticism can also be defined through hope as well as despair. Um, Whitman and Emerson that, that you'll read next week is a great example. Mm -hmm. uh, light romanticism, dark romanticism, and in a number of texts it shifts from one to the other. Um, but it manifests itself in different ways. But hope can never be just a hope in the change of a private experience. It has to be an experience that that leaves a mark on the, on the public world. Yes, right? yes, that's right, that's exactly uh, right. And that's, is, cannot be, cannot escape this confrontation with the institution of that's, that's, that's correct, that is correct. Um, there's, a, there's another hand up? Yeah, go ahead. I have a question. <clears throat> 
um, or summarize the incident. Yeah, so basically, why, why, was, like, what's why the, is the primary distribution the more important principle? than the secondary distribution? Yeah, what's the underlying principle behind your uh, statement that the first order redistribution is more important than the second order redistribution? Well, because the primary distribution is the fundamental access to resources and opportunities. You can, if you correct it after the fact, you begin to create a contradiction, a tension between the logic of the established system and some other logic. So you say, we'll allow for the markets, but for example, you had you supp suppose you try and resolve the, uh, the, the, the problem by worker ownership of firms which was a popular idea in the late 20th century. Mm -hmm. And you say, you'll take the property from the individual owners, the asset holding class, and you'll make the workers the owners of the firm. And then what's going to happen if some firms fail, other firms flourish, prosper? Will the prospering firms be able to buy out the fail firms, and will they then be able to consign the workers in those failed firms to a second order citizenship in which they will be wage workers mm -hmm. rather than worker owners? Mm -hmm. uh, so that would be, if you do that, then you're simply reproducing the logic of accumulation. On the other hand, if you say, no, they can't do that, then you're creating a stasis. You're uh, you're, uh, you're you're putting a a uh, a grid right. on the system and preventing it from developing. So you're saying there's no market. So the problem with the secondary distribution is that its economic logic fights with the logic of the established order, and that's why it can never be huge. So. You, you could say, uh, you can have, the, the market generates certain inequalities. Now let's correct those inequalities after the fact. If you, if, if the inequalities are massive, the correction has to be massive. And if the correction is massive, then it subverts the logic of the system. So the correct solution is to create another system not to try and correct it after the fact. Now this, has, this problem has a close relation to the understanding of the theories of justice that flourished in the Anglo-American world, in, in, especially in the academy, in the late 20th century, like the Rawlsian theory of justice. The paradox of these theories is that on their face, they're radically egalitarian. Uh, is an egalitarian, but the radical egalitarianism is combined with an institutional agnosticism or skepticism. They have no institutional idea. So what is the pragmatic residue of this combination of radical egalitarianism with institutional conservatism or skepticism? It's to say those principles of justice are really just a kind of pseudo-philosophical prop to the homely practices of compensatory <laughs> redistribution under institutionally conservative social democracy. So it seems very radical and very abstract and so forth, but what it all amounts to is saying you can take a little more in taxation uh, to attenuate the inequalities <laughs> of the market order. That's what it is. So if you took seriously structural change, that's not how you would do things. So that's why the theories of justice were the theoretical accompaniment to this period in which the rest of the democracies abandoned the effort at structural change and attempted simply to humanize the existing market work. And the progressives then appeared on the stage of contemporary history as the humanizers of the inevitable. If you ask what was their program, the answer was, their program is the program of their conservative adversaries with a humanizing discount.
<laughs> I have another question on your, in the section on the relation between labor and capital. So you describe um, organized versus disorganized parts of the labor market and uh, point out that the disorganized part is predominant. Everywhere um, now. Everywhere now, yes. And um, for the organized part, the remedy is unionization. And or used to be. Or used to be. And, um, but you also uh, highlight the, I, the automatic unionization of all workers. Well, I'm, but I'm saying that's too late, probably. You know. It's too in, late, okay. In the United States and the North Atlantic world, there's this idea of collective right. bargaining. Right. right. So it's the contractualist model. Right. Uh, Latin America copied the leftist nationalist populist regimes of Latin America, copied from Mussolini's Italy, yes, copied yes, from yes, fascism, yes. a corporatist regime. Yes. The corporatist regime was based on two principles. Everyone would automatically be unionized. That was the first principle. Right. And the unions would be an instrument of controlled mass mobilization by the state. So they would be effectively under the tutelage or the guidance of the Ministry of Labor. Okay. That was the corporate regime. The contractualist regime is it's a form of collective contract designed to create countervailing power under the conditions of extreme inequality of bargaining power in the employment relation. And unionization is completely free, right. completely independent from the state. We imagine it as by analogy to private contract. Right. Now, when I say that in principle, the best solution would be a combination of these two that would take from the corporatist regime the principle of automatic unionization. Everyone is unionized automatically. You don't have to fight to be a union. Right. Right. The union is a gift of the law. Right. But the union is completely independent from the state. Right. So right. The, the different factions within the labor movement compete for position in the unitary structure of the unions, right. just as different political parties in a democracy compete for position in the state. Right. That would be the hybrid regime. Right. That would be the best. But this illustrates a point that we don't control history. It may be too late, right? right. right? right. right. Uh, because Unionization <coughs> is a 20th century solution now to a 21st century problem. Right. And that's okay. So that's I mean, my the, the the larger question is that when reading that, it reminded me of um, the Wobblies, the industrial workers of the world, in which their central tenet was that all workers, um, including the head of a company, all workers had an equal voice and an equal vote. It was so essentially they conceptualize corporations as thoroughly democratic. Everyone, regardless mm -hmm. of station, has an equal vote and an equal voice. And uh, but the ba the basic question in that section, the other yes, in yes. institutional domain here is the the status of labor. Right. What is right. what is free work? Right. So the 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 idea in the nineteenth century of the liberals and the socialists, which accorded with the perspective of this national petty bourgeoisie, right. was that wage work is a deficient and transitory form of free work. And Retaining many of the characteristics of serfdom and slavery. Right. And it should give way over time to the higher forms of free work, which are self employment and cooperation. But that's, that's they were right. never able to show how such an economy, right. dependent on self employment and spontaneous cooperation, would be compatible with the organ, with the, with aggregation of resources at scale. Right. Which is another version of the property problem. Right, right. But if every worker had an equal voice and an equal vote, uh, 
and uh, you mean workers in existing enterprises in, with jobs? In, yes, yes. But what about all the other workers? Because the essential problem is the problem of dualism. In all of these societies, there's always an expanding periphery of the semi-employed, the precarious employed, the unemployed, the informal workers in the developing countries, right. the precarious workers in the rich countries. So you can't have a solution which gives claims to those who, who have these positions in the established firm if the main problem is the vast reserve labor army, to use Marxist concept, right, right, outside. Right. So the, 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 the vision or the idea of an equal voice and an equal vote for all workers would not solve the problem of, um, of workers who, um, uh, who are not part of a, yes. a organization. Yes. Um, rather, the, uh, so the equal voice and an equal vote would not encourage the uh, all workers to become part of an organization. Well, they might not be able to. I mean, that's that's a circumstance. So, so we, in, a, in a in a in a typical middle income country today. Right. Take countries like Indonesia, or Brazil, or right. Turkey, Nigeria. Right. The the the. There's a huge mass of workers right. who are autonomous, uh, right. uh, who are not, do not have stable connections with a business organization. Right. Uh, they're, they're, they, they're, they've given up, they don't, yes. they're not able to, yes. and they can't. Yes. So the, this, the project of lifting them up can't have as its adversity simply the backward firms of the organized economy. It also has to address the problems of this mass, right. this semi-employed or unstably employed mass of autonomous or semi-autonomous worker. That's a large part of the labor force. But couldn't they organize themselves into a, the equivalent of a company? Uh, there has to be some form, and there has to be some way in which they can be lifted up. Uh, so, right, right, even, right. even when they're independent. So, right. so the nurse practitioner yes, yes. or the machine repair yes. person yes. transformed into a technologically equipped artisan. Right. So, the lift up, the uplift operation, the, the inclusion into uh, a dynamic of increasing productivity cannot just address people with positions in business organizations, but all of the others. Right, that's right. Okay. That makes sense. So I guess I, these, the, I, we shouldn't lose sight of the central idea. So the central idea is that the, the way in which the country understands itself is through the connection that it establishes between a certain idea of autonomy, right. of the effective exercise of agency. In other words, the individual sees himself not just as a beneficiary, someone who is co-opted or paid off, right. but as an agent, as someone who can create things, who can be part of the story, right? right. But that, I, that abstraction, of agency derives its content from its connection with a host of institutional details. That's right. That's and then the details will matter because the details are the fate of the society. And the, the, the actual institutional organization of labor, of, of the firm, of property, and of democracy, and then of education. So that's, that's what's that's the crucial point. Right. Huh? And so if, if we attack that nexus, right. connecting uh, the idea of agency or autonomy to the institutional, we go to the heart of the matter. Huh? But how to do that? Huh? Yes. Because yes. That's, a, that's then a form of education which transcends politics yes. in the ordinary <coughs> sense. Because 
it has to have a dimension which is prophetic or visionary. Right. Uh, it's a politics about consciousness yeah. and not simply about the redesign of institutions. Yes. I'm curious, Professor, in the said higher energy between sort of a corpus model of trade unionism and contractual. Louder, please. Sorry, and not uh, this hybrid regime between um, a corpus model of trade unionism and a contractual one. What do you think is the role of trade unions and political parties? What do you think is their ideal fit? The role of which? Of trade unions and political parties. Are they, you know, forming the thing? Do they, you know, the role of money? trade unions and political parties. The role where? In a hybrid regime. Like the, the one you were describing is sort of the ideal. Well, I don't understand. The hybrid regime is a regime for trade unions, right? Uh, and uh, I think that the, the collective, bar, the contractualist labor law regime has a political logic. Mm -hmm. So its, it's negative consequences are first that the tendency in a contractualist labor law regime is to express and reinforce the underlying structural inequalities of the production system. So in capital intensive, highly advanced firms, the owners and the workers have common interests. The wage bill is a relatively small part of the fund of the firm. And they have common interests against everyone else, against all the workers in, who are either precariously employed or who are in the less capital intensive parts of the firm. So the collective bargaining system then expresses and reinforces this underlying inequality. Second, the collective bargaining system is a system in which the energy of the union movement is consumed in the effort to unionize. Uh, there's a struggle to unionize rather than the alternative that I described in which unionization is the point of departure. It's the automatic gift of the law. Then you decide what to do with it. The third negative feature of the collective bargaining system is its economistic tendency. Under a collective bargaining system, the Overriding questions for the unions are wages and benefits. And they every day they have to fight again the battle of unionization. Under the hybrid regime, the agenda expands. So the question becomes other questions. Uh, the national organization, the institutional structure. So it's far superior. But I think it's anathema. Uh, so, like, or take another subject. The, the men, so in the United States, half of the people vote in elections. What about the other half? So, uh, it would be easy to correct that if, they, if the United States had a system, which many countries have, Australia, Belgium, a host of developing countries, the vote is mandatory. Uh, now, but that's anathema in the United States, is if it were coercive. Well, why is it coercive? There was uh, military conscription in many periods in American history, uh, direct taxation, which requires you to do 10 times more work to file your personal income tax than every few years to go to the voting booth and direct your attention to the affairs of the Republic for five, 10 minutes. Uh, and, with the privilege of abstaining. So things that are supposed to be impossible are clearly not impossible. And there's this feature of, now, this is related to a, uh, a feature of the history of ideas in social theory because the predominant influence on the progressives was of course Marxism as an intellectual system. So Marxism has the idea. There is a structure, the structure is decisive, but the way of imagining the structure is circumscribed by a series of illusions. So the structures are come from a menu, a closed menu of 
systems. Feudalism, capitalism, socialism, slave society before, and you have to pick one of those things. Uh, the second net illusory assumption is that each of those systems is indivisible. So the result is a binary idea of politics. Either you have the reformist management of a system or you have the revolutionary substitution of one system by another. Now that's not how real structural change is in history. Real structural change is almost always fragmentary. Uh, and this idea of the revolutionary substitution of a whole system by another is a fantasy for the most part. It's an idealized limit. It's not the ordinary form of structural change. And the third is that there are laws that govern the full ordained succession of these indivisible systems in history. Well, if there are laws, then we don't need to have a project. And we shouldn't try to have a project because history has a project for us. So those are all, those are all the consequences of the ideas in which the progressives for 200 years or 150 years believed. Uh, now today, there are very few people that believe in the heroic assumptions of that theory. But they continue to use the vocabulary of the theory. So it's a kind of self-deception. So mark capitalism and so forth as if, as if they believed in the assumption. But the, the, the words only make sense in that social theoretical context. So this is all part of the confusion. So an activity of liberation today has to involve combating these theories because they're part of the problem. Yes. John, you're going to have to help me. I need to follow you. Could you repeat I that would. again? <laughs> so, would you support a like a more like since you said that change is fragmentary? Would you support a policy saying that we should start taxing capital gains, as, as you seem to suggest? Tax is not taxes. Taxation, in principle, is not uh, structural. Right? It's, 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 this, it's the form that's corrective redistribution. And the discussion about inequality is all a huge confusion. So the, 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 could we just take five minutes to discuss this question of taxation? It, because it's, it's, it's an aside. So I would say three principles. So the first overriding principle is that with, with respect to uh, inequality, what matters is the structure, the primary distribution. We were, that's what we were discussing. And the difference between changing the primary distribution and changing the corrective distribution. So the most admired system of social organization in the world is Scandinavian social democracy to this day. If the world could vote to be a country, it would vote to be Sweden. But not the real Sweden, this imaginary Sweden, uh, because what happened in the, in the Scandinavian countries was that for most of the 20th century, there was a struggle between the social democratic state and the dynastic family familial plutocracy that continues to own much of the economy in these countries. Their families like in Sweden, that own much of the production system. So there was, a, there was a struggle over access to economic and political power. And this struggle ended in a truce 
in which those families were allowed to remain in control of the assets, but the control was limited by a set of legal restrictions, which gave power to the state. Then comes this apparatus of social democratic redistribution through taxation, which was a kind of accessory. Uh, it wasn't the central story, it's the epilogue. But the world doesn't see that. So the world wants the epilogue without the preceding narrative of the struggle between the state and the dynastic family. So that's the first principle. Structure trumps corrective redistribution. The second principle is that with respect to the budget, on the revenue raising side and on the spending side, what matters most in the short term is not the progressive profile of taxation on the revenue raising side, but the aggregate level of the tax take and how it is spent. So on paper, the American tax system is more progressive than the European tax. United States is by far the most unequal of the rich industrial democracies, but on paper it has the most progressive tax system. The European tax systems, the European countries are much more egalitarian, but on paper their, their tax system is regressive because it is overwhelmingly based on the comprehensive flat rate value added tax or some functional equivalent to it. Now what is this? flat rate value added tax. It's like a, it takes a constant proportion of the value of every transformation of an input into an, into an output. And therefore, conceptually, it is the most neutral tax. It is neutral with respect to the system of relative prices. As a result, it makes it possible to maximize the tax take, minimizing the economic disruption. So the basic reason why the European systems are more egalitarian than the American is very simple. They take at least 10% of GDP more in taxes in the tax case than the Americans. So it's progressive because everything that it loses by way of progressivity on the revenue raising side of the budget, it gains in double on the spending side simply by having a higher tax state. And no one understands that, or very few people understand that. Mm -hmm. So taxation is a mystery. And in the United States, at election time, the politicians, the progressive politicians, all want to say they want progressive taxes, because that's their way of showing on whose side they are. Even though they know, or they should know, that progressive taxation is practically inconsequential has no significance. The income tax in particular is a terrible instrument. The income tax is basically a tax on the wages of the so-called middle class. Rich people don't pay income <coughs> tax in the United States or anywhere in the world. The income tax is not paid for by the rich. Uh, but it is the favored uh, instrument of the progressive politicians. Now, so that's the second principle. Now you come to the third principle, going down the hierarchy of principles. If you really wanted to have a direct progressive tax, this is how you would do it. Direct redistributive taxation has two main targets. One target is the accumulation of economic power. The second target is the hierarchy of living standards. What people spend for their for the, on themselves, for their standard of living. Now, the accumulation of economic power is very hard to reach to taxation, through taxation. The most effective way to reach it is a debt. By the massive taxation of inheritance and anticipated inheritance through gifts and survivors. That's how you would reach it. And the hierarchy of living standards you reach by a so-called Caldor tax named after Nicholas Caldor, a disciple of Keynes. Now, what's the, what's, the, what's, what's the Caldor tax? It says, you subtract from all of your income, both returns to, to labor, labor income and capital income, you subtract your invested savings. 
that difference between your income and your invested savings is what you spend on yourself. That's the hierarchy of standard of living. And that's what you tax. And you tax it on a steeply progressive slope. So uh, below a certain level of living, you don't pay anything. You get. That's what the Americans call the negative income tax. As you go up, you pay more and more. And beyond a certain level of luxury living, the sky's the limit. So you say, 100% is not the maximum rate. It could be 500%. You could say, for every dollar you spend on yourself, you pay five to the government. That's the CalDOR tax. So it has no, there's no technical difficulty. It's technical difficulties are the same as the income tax. So if the progressives were sincere in their devotion to progressive taxation, that's the tax that they would prefer because there the sky's the limit. The only limit is political power and political will. That's how you would, that's how you would redistribute through taxation. So uh, it's very simple. It, I think in five minutes I've described the three principles of taxation. But no one explains this to the people. Uh, there, there, there's no political, there's no pedagogy to, to to explain the significance of these things. So the people live in darkness, right? <laughs> and, and, uh, but it can be explained. The darkness is not necessary. Uh, it, it can all be illuminated. I, just, I want to quote Roberto on a, a couple lines near the end, which I love, and you can maybe elaborate on them. One is, uh, as your part of your conclusion, the spiritual equivalents to this economic horizon have been individualism, materialism, and consumerism, and in a religious vocabulary, the theology of prosperity. Yeah. So we're going to talk about Brazil, right, in yes, two weeks. So. Yes, so we're going to talk about Brazil in two weeks. So, and so. then it goes on to say, at the end of the paragraph, the European left committed its most, it committed its most faithful fateful mistake in the 20th century when it demonized such people and drove them into the arms of the fascist right. Absolutely. <laughs> so the petty bourgeois, yes. the small business class, yes. were the demons of the left. Yes, uh, yes, they were. They were, uh, in every possible way, ridiculed, derided, attacked yes. by the left. Yes. And of course, they became the mainstay That's right. of the fascist and not Nazi party. That's right. Right. Yeah, entirely unnecessary. Yes. There's a very simple fact about the world. Yes. Today, the industrial proletariat, the workers headquartered in the capital intensive sectors of manufacturing, are a tiny minority right. Right. and a relatively privileged minority compared to the vast mass of the people. Right. So who's the majority? The majority are these people who are poor and disorganized but have a petty bourgeois horizon of aspiration. Right. They're not actually a small business class, but their horizon of aspiration is to petty be bourgeois, that. to yes. be that. Yes. Their dream yes. is this dream yes. of having a, a, a little plot of land, a yes. farm, yes. A, and, and that's what they want to be. So in, in Modi's Indi India, and Erdogan's Turkey, and, Bolsonaro's Brazil, it's all the same thing. Yes. Uh, so what is necessary then is for there to be a nationalist and productivist counter elite, yes. for it to seize power, for it to approach its majority yes. and offer it an alternative way of realizing its aspiration to modest prosperity and independence. An alternative to the backward looking form of isolated and archaic family business. But now, the question for the United States is, what is the American equivalent to that story? That's our question here. Right. Is, so they missed the boat on preserving the initial impulse of the decentralized small-scale economy in New York right. and creating the alternative legal and institutional basis to reconcile that with the dynamic of industrial concentration of modern industry. 
And now, retrospectively, what does it mean? Can they get on that boat again in some different way? That's the question before us. Yeah, and it's a, it's a great question. <laughs> it's a great question. Uh, it would require, I mean, as you point out, massive major restructuring, both materially and um, spiritually and intellectually. So when this majority, uh, objective small business class or aspirant to small business class, uh, does, is bereft yeah. of another way, it devolves into the spirituality yes, yes. of the theology of prosperity, yes. consumerism, materialism, and individualism. Yes. It accumulates stuff. It's like Robinson Crusoe on his island. Yes. Yes. Why does Robinson Crusoe accumulate stuff? Why is accumulation the principle of the, of the English novel? Because accumulation is the alternative to solidarity. People accumulate things so as not to depend on other people. That's the whole, that's the whole point of accumulation. Uh, so th there's a direct connection. And it's an important point yeah. of the our artisanal ideal, the independent, independent entrepreneur, yeah. artisan, the independent entrepreneur, artisan. Uh, so you connect it to to faith and. At the end, I'll just read the end, which I think is magnificent. In religion, uh, the, uh, the petty bourgeois, um, their most common habit has been to adopt the idea of the sharing of the individual in the infinity of God. God is within you and me and within all people. They have, however, allowed this faith to be twice corrupted by failure to acknowledge the place of solidarity in self-fashioning and by idolatrous acquiescence, idolatrous acquiescence in the sufficiency and finality of the economic and political arrangements that they have been taught to revere. The subjectivity of petty bourgeoisie cannot become an objective petty bourgeoisie by conforming to the formulas that their reactionary political and ideological friends have urged on them. But if they rid themselves of such guides and re reject their doctrines, they will also not become an objective petty bourgeoisie. Instead, they will have moved a little closer to being free men and women. They will have won their greater freedom by rebelling against the dictatorship of no alternatives. Always hope. <laughs> yes, there is always hope. So I think that the uh, I think this is a form of, of action which we don't, do not know in the, in the modern world, right? Because the implication is that a consequential resistance to the present state of affairs, the creation of an alternative, requires you to be a technician to deal with a lot of details, it requires content. And which can't be brought just under the heading of these abstractions like socialism. Changes, real structural changes, piecemeal, it's fragmentary, but cumulative, potentially. But it also has this other element, which is prophetic and visionary. And who's going to do that? So how are we going to combine those, how are we going to combine the prophetic and the technical? As we must. Presumably through some kind of division of labor or what the new collective practices. Both that, I, I will get to this, but I think education can serve that function too, of, um, providing practical and uh, ideological um, 
visions that uh, can come together. Possibly. I mean, what are what are the, the yeah. <laughs> We'll be discussing later the, the role of education um, and the, uh, how and why education uh, for all people matters uh, through Dewey and other right the special chapter. Any other questions or comments or criticisms? I don't think we have to stay. Maybe no, we don't. Let that. me just um, end by saying, so next week, um, I want you all to read carefully uh, Emerson, Self-Reliance, Whitman's, it's on the syllabus, Song of Occupations, uh, Melville's Bartleby the Scrivener, and Lincoln's Second Inaugural, and discuss these texts in relation to the discussion today. Absolutely. Um, so we want to. I want. I want you to think about these texts. And maybe one place to begin that discussion, John, is is by asking, what's the relation between the protagonists of Emerson's essay, Self Reliance, and Bartleby? Yes. Yes. Yeah. What's the relation between them, the protagonists of Self Reliance, well, and the protagonists of Whitman's Song for Occupations? Uh -huh. um, and, uh, and Bartleby is an outlier, you'll see if you haven't read Bartleby, it's a brilliant um, novella, uh, and it's radically different, but what is the relationship between Emerson's self-reliance, Whitman's Song of Occupations, and Bartleby, and what, how does that relate to uh, the discussion and uh, Roberto's overthrow of the dictatorship of no alternatives? But the point of today's discussion was to anticipate this idea of autonomy. Yes, yes, say. yes. It's crucified. Yes, it's yes, nailed to the yes, cross yes. of the practical arrangements of society. Yeah. Uh, and so that's where we have to find it. Yes. And take it down. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Which um, Bartleby certainly did. Well, <laughs> you can, you can uh, decide for yourselves how, how, how these texts for next week relate to this notion of Good. Yeah. Okay, we'll see you uh, next week. So that was <laughs> Intellectually, I
to the same. It's um, no close to the Harvard Museum of Natural History. Oh, so it's, it's on it's on uh, Oxford Street. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's the main. It's must be near Lowell. Lowell Lecture Hall. Yeah. It's. Uh, um, so what number is it? It's. Um, Answered building. So the actual address is 29 Francis Avenue. Oh, I know that one. That's a weird building. It's got a, it's got a workshop in it. Yeah, it's an like ar ar it was the original Roxy building. Yeah, they've got this workshop where they do piano restoration of all things. Yeah. It's crazy. Okay. Um, I'm here. Yeah, so last week it went better. It was much more of a discussion with students. I think he has the best version. 